Welcome to a drink with John. Uh, now, unfortunately, we don't actually have physical <laughs> drinks here, so this is going to have to be a metaphorical drink uh, in this case. Uh, but in any event, uh, I am joined this time uh, by someone I have known for a very long time, one of my favorite people in the Catholic Church, Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles. Archbishop, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. Great to be here. Now, we are together uh, here at what is basically the biggest annual jamboree uh, <laughs> in North American Catholicism, uh, yeah. which is the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress. And you were, of course, you're not the founder of it. That, of course, happened under Cardinal Mahoney, but you are the host, so to speak. Right. Uh, now, let me, because this thing, you know, every year brings together 35 or 40,000 people. It's in multiple languages. You got English, you got Spanish, you got Vietnamese, you know, everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a huge logistical undertaking, right? This is essentially the American Rimini, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Rimini being the reference to the, the big meeting that Communal Liberation hosts every year uh, in Italy. Right. Uh, have you, let me ask you, first of all, let me start with this. Has anybody in the archdiocese ever sat down with a calculator? to add up how many person hours it takes every year to make this thing happen? I don't think so. I, <laughs> be I don't interesting know. To know right? Right? Yeah, it would be very interesting, yeah. Because this is like a NASA space launch that you, know, <laughs> you have to put together on an annual basis. Listen, I'm sure you hear this all the time when you come to Congress. I'm sure you have people coming up to you and saying, thank you for doing this. Uh, you know, I just want to add Crux's voice and my voice personally to that mix. You know, I was talking to one of your auxiliary bishops today, Bishop Bob Barron. Yeah. Uh, and we were comparing notes. He told me that the first Congress he had come to was 97. Um, I was trying to think. I think my first one was 2001. Um, but we've both been doing this a while. Uh, and what I find every year is that this thing is like a shot of adrenaline straight to the heart. You know, because of course, as a journalist, like I spend a lot of my time covering stories of crisis and scandal and division and infighting. And of course, I mean, you know as well as I do, all of those things are real. Yeah. Uh, and you know, painful experience has taught us that if you ignore them, that doesn't take you any place good. <laughs> you know, uh, but it certainly is not the whole Catholic story. Uh, and and the positive energy at this thing to me is just amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I come away, I always come away every year feeling better about the state of the American Catholic Church just by virtue of having been in this mix for a while. Is, is that your takeaway too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the first time that I came was when I became the Archbishop of Los Angeles in, in uh, 2011. And, and it's just an amazing uh, Congress. So you've never been to a, a Congress? No, because, never. of course, prior in your career, you had been the Auxiliary Bishop of Denver mm -hmm. under Archbishop Charles Chaput, and then you were the Archbishop of San Antonio. San Antonio yeah. But those experiences never brought you to this thing? No. Uh, I knew about it, obviously, but, uh, but I, I never had a chance to come and, and enjoy it because it's, it's just a, a beautiful reality and so many people from all over the world and some just people, as you are saying, excited about the Catholic faith. So um, for me, it was a big surprise and, and uh, 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 um, it, of, of a beautiful reality that kind of reflects what the Archdiocese of Los Angeles is all about. You know, not too many people, I guess, not too many people think, think of, the, of Los Angeles as a place of faith. But what I experienced coming to hey, Los it's Angeles. it's the city of angels. Come on. Yeah, it is. <laughs> But, but it's also the city of Hollywood. Yeah, of course, and, and deeply <laughs> secular and all of that, right. right? But you're right. I mean, like, the, 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 the life of the church in this archdiocese, if you actually start to think about it for a moment, right. is just flabbergasting. I mean, what is the number now? How many languages do you celebrate Mass in every Sunday? Uh, 42. <laughs> I mean, I remember, you know, I had this conversation with Cardinal Mahoney a few years ago, and I remember I think at that stage it was like 35 or something, but I mean, you constantly have to reflect yes. the changing demographics of the Archdiocese. That's correct. But that is just a staggering number. It's amazing, and every single parish is, par is packed with people. It's just beautiful. I know, the, the faith is flourishing here. Yes. I mean, you know, certainly, like, there is a narrative of Catholic decline in America, and there are places where that is definitely true, right? You know, where numbers are falling, mass attendance is falling, vocations are falling. I mean, all of that is real. But that certainly is not the story here. No, it's Let me ask you this. If, you, if money were no object, okay, if you won the lottery, <laughs> okay, how many new parishes would you open and say the next year? 
Well, I, uh, the, the, the challenge here is that, that uh, the territory is not that big. So uh, we have uh, uh, three, um, three counties in the archdiocese, and the, 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 the territory of the archdiocese is about 9,000 square miles. Compared with other dioceses, it's, very, it's small. Yeah, but the population is enormous. Yeah, and yeah. the people are together. Most of the people are in L.A. County. So uh, we don't really need too many new churches. We need to make the ones that we have bigger. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, 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 allow more people to come to one church right. because everybody's together. So What's I don't the number think we need to make uh, of the number of people who show up at the cathedral every week for Mass? Uh, the, the capacity of the cathedral is about 3,000 people. So and we have three masses, and the three masses are, are packed. It's and you fill them all up, yes. right? So we're talking about like 10,000 people probably That's every right. weekend coming to the cathedral alone. That's correct. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, it's just staggering. It okay? is. Uh, and, and i got to say, I mean, for me, every time I come to this place, I feel like my kind of Catholic batteries have been recharged uh, because just the, the, the energy here and the dynamism and the passion that you feel uh, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, I give you one statistic that might be uh, interesting to you. Uh, we have uh, in the last couple of years like about sixty thousand baptisms in the archdiocese. Sixty thousand. Sixty thousand of infants, and and uh, and the archdiocese uh, of uh, Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, and New York have less than that combined. Combined. You mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that gives you an idea the the number of people that that uh, uh, are active in the church. You know. So you're like the, the John Paul II of dioceses, if you think, you know, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, John Paul, in terms of his foreign, per foreign trips, uh, you know, not only traveled more than previous popes, he traveled more than all previous popes combined. In terms of his beatifications <laughs> and canonizations, he not only did more than all previous popes, but more than all previous popes yeah. combined, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you are the John Paul of archdioceses, right? <laughs> right? That's correct. Uh, listen, a... Uh, you know, obviously, part of your role as the shepherd of this archdiocese uh, is to respond to the challenges and the pastoral realities that you confront. Uh, and of course, in this archdiocese, you know, the list of pastoral challenges is almost infinite. But, but obviously, a pride of place has to go to the immigra the issue of immigration, right? Because you were so much an immigrant archdiocese in so many ways, uh, and you have been very outspoken. Uh, on the issue of immigration. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll get to your, your read on current realities in a moment. But can I ask you a media question first? Sure. That is, of course, I've known you a long time, right? Uh, and in the media, earlier in your career, okay, you were often presented as a conservative because, of course, you know, you, the Opus Dei connection and, and you're known for your emphasis on catechesis and all that, right? So right. when you were in Denver, and even to some extent when you were in San Antonio, right, the, the media read was that this is a conservative vision, right? Now, <laughs> since you got to L.A., and because the immigration issue has been so important and because you have spoken so passionately on this issue, now there's a tendency in the media to style you as a liberal when really you were just the same guy you've always been. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> does that ever strike you as like oh, yeah. bizarre? Yeah, it's, it's surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah because uh, uh, it's difficult for people to understand that the Catholic Church cares about both sides of the uh, political aisle, you know? So I, I think the, the tendency is to, to give a, a label to people, like we're on this side or the other side, and really, yeah, like John Paul, St. John Paul II, when he last time, one of the times that he came to the United States, the media couldn't really uh, um, kind of uh, identify him with one side or the other because he was talking on both sides of the aisle. So I think in a yeah, sense I mean, that's what happens is, to him. Catholic America. social teaching and the binary nature of American politics just are not a match made in heaven. That's correct. Right? Yeah. I mean, every time the bishops, and of course now as vice president of the conference, you have to think about this stuff. You know, I mean, every time the conference puts out a statement, say, on abortion or contraception, it's like, okay, you know, this is, these are the chaplains of the religious right, right? These are cultural warriors. You know, every time you put out a statement on the poor or war right. or immigration, right, oh, you're just catering or, to or the left. Or health care, for that matter. Or health care, you know? right, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, so on the immigration issue, I mean, I, I, of course, because I know you, I know that this is not a new concern for you. I, I know this was close to your heart when you were in Denver and when you were in San Antonio and all the way along. 
But of course, it's taken on new prominence now that you're the Archbishop of Los Angeles and you're Vice President of the U.S. Bishops' Conference. What is your quick take uh, on the early moves we have seen from the Trump administration uh, in terms of its approach to immigrants and refugees? Well, the first concern that I have is that, that, that people are very afraid. You know, they, they are scared. They don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and, and that's my, my first concern, because I see how much they are suffering, uh, uh, especially uh, e even uh, you know, families, uh, parents, and children. Sometimes what we experience in our Catholic schools and in our parishes is the, the children saying, I don't want to go to school today because I don't know if my parents are going to be home tonight. So that's, that's the first reaction. To, and it's a consequence of the, um, the way that the immigration issue is being presented uh, 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 and also the executive orders. Because it's clear in the executive orders, uh, the first one, that uh, anybody that is in this country with no documents is a criminal. Uh, the, uh, the way that, that President Trump is, is portraying that is that uh, uh, it's going to be just really bad criminals. But if you read the executive order, you see that anybody <laughs> is in that situation. Yeah. So it's very concerning in that sense because these people are good people. Uh, uh, and we understand in the Catholic Church that they, they are some criminals. They go, they go to the uh, normal judicial process and, and if they have to be deported, they're going to be deported. But most of the people are just good uh, people that are here because they want to uh, uh, take care of the children, uh, improve their, their, their life, and make a positive contribution to our country. Uh, I was the other day uh, celebrating Mass in one of our parishes, St. Helens in Southgate, uh, in um, South LA. And I was thinking, you seen all the people there, the, what, the church was packed. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe some of these have no documents. Maybe most of them. And they're wonderful people. Yeah. They're in church. They have their kids here. Uh, they're working hard, they pay taxes, they really are part of our, of our um, tradition of uh, this country being a country of immigrants. And now, I don't know what's going to happen to them, because yeah. they are good, normal people. So um, that's the concern that we have in the church about this situation. Now, you, are, of course, are incredibly passionate and eloquent on this issue. You know who else? is incredibly passionate and eloquent on this issue, your boss. Uh, yeah. Because of course in the Catholic Church, a bishop's superior is the Pope. Right. Okay, uh, and Pope Francis, I mean, as you know better than anybody, uh, is extraordinarily, profoundly committed to this issue. Now, the current rumor uh, is that when President Trump goes to Italy in May for the G8 meeting, Oh. Uh, that while he is there, uh, there will also be a meeting between Pope Francis uh, and President Trump, probably in the Vatican, because generally protocol is if an American president comes to Italy, it's sort of obligatory, you know, to make a stop to see the Pope. If that meeting happens, what would you hope Pope Francis would say to President Trump on this issue? Uh, I, I hope that, that the Holy Father is going to tell him that, that the issue is, is, is about people. It's about uh, uh, um, parents and children, husband and wife, that's what, what this issue is all about. It's, it's not about economics or uh, the U.S. economy, or it's about people. And uh, that we, we have to find a way, I hope that he tells him, the way to, to, to find a solution of the problem. It's a global reality. Yep. People are moving. I mean, they, in Italy, you know, or Greece or any of those countries. People come from Africa, from the Middle East. People are moving everywhere. Absolutely right. So, uh, I, I, and I think the United States, as we are the leader of the world, we should find a way to facilitate the movements of people. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the Pope, is, the Pope Francis is going to tell him, hey, you know, what are you talking about? Now, uh, just give us some inside <laughs> scoop here. You think Francis is going to call you to, to get some talking points before he has that meeting? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't think he needs to call me. Well, he I'm, probably I'm learning from him. So. He probably doesn't need any talking points, <laughs> right, right? Because yeah. he probably has it down. 
Uh, all right, listen, uh, last thing before we let you go. Speaking of Pope Francis, uh, we are coming up on a major milestone. Uh, March 13th will be the fourth anniversary ah. of his election to the papacy. And while that will be commented on and kind of celebrated around the world, you know, it probably has a kind of special power for Americans because for us, four years is a presidential term, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, so in a sense, this is the end of Francis's first term, right? Uh, and so I would expect... Is he, is he up for election? Well, see, I, I just, <laughs> here in the Congress, I said that this afternoon when I was doing my session, I said, now the big difference here, of course, is that popes don't stand for re-election. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of a different deal in the Vatican. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, we can't help thinking in those terms. So I want to ask you, looking back at these last four years, we at Crux, we're going to be doing a, a kind of, we're polling Catholic luminaries around the world for what they would consider to be their, their list of the most important moments from those four years. So I'm, I'm just curious, uh, I mean, do you have one or two or whatever it is, uh, moments or statements or gestures or whatever it is uh, from Pope Francis over these last four years that have had for you special power, special significance? Um. Sure. Well, I think the, the first one that I can think of is, is his trip to Lampedusa, because he was uh, he, he he went out of his way to uh, uh, to uh, be with the immigrants coming to Italy. Uh, so uh, that was a, for me it was a beautiful uh, gesture of helping us to understand that that immigration is about. Uh, Just in case anybody watching this doesn't know, Lampedusa is an island in the southern Mediterranean. Technically, it is part of Sicily uh, in Italy, although it's actually physically closer to Tunisia than it is to Italy. Uh, and Pope Francis's very first trip outside of Rome, actually, in early Ju People think it was Brazil for World Youth Day, but it wasn't, no. uh, because this was early July 2013. He went to that, which is a primary point of arrival for impoverished migrants from Africa and the Middle East, uh, many of whom try to make this crossing over the Mediterranean in these rickety, unsafe, overcrowded, illegal boats. The estimate is 20,000 people uh, have died in the last couple of decades alone trying to make that crossing. Right. Uh, and so he goes to Lampedusa to lay a wreath in the sea to commemorate those victims. It was actually the first time he rolled out what has since become one of the kind of standard rhetorical devices of his papacy, which is this difference between what he calls a throwaway culture, mm -hmm. right, uh, in which whole categories of humanity, whether we're talking migrants and refugees, whether we're talking the unborn, uh, the elderly, uh, the unemployed, you know, are regarded as basically disposable, right. right, versus what he calls a culture. I mean, it's a much more powerful term in Spanish, isn't it? Right, the culture of encuentro. See, si. mm -hmm. right, a and Absolutely. you know, for, when you say in English the culture of welcome, you think of like a hotel clerk. Or <laughs> <right>? <laughs> so it doesn't have the same magic, right, right in English as it does in Spanish. But right. you know, uh, so that I agree with you. I think that trip was absolutely foundational in terms of setting, a, you know, sending a signal of what this pope was going to be about. Right. Okay. Do you have a second moment? Um, well, I have a lot of personal moments with him. But uh, uh, I can I can tell you one of them was the first time that uh, I, I, I had the blessing of celebrating mass with him uh, at Santa Marta, which was when uh, just uh, like a week after, no, two weeks after his election. Wow! Yeah, I probably was yeah. the first American bishop to celebrate to celebrate with him at Santa Marta. You know, the cardinals celebrate with him after the election, but uh, but I think I was the first one. Uh, and so and the Santa special. Marta, of course, is the residence on Vatican grounds, mm -hmm. where, you know, prior to Francis, it used to be like the Vatican Hotel, Hotel. right? Correct. And it still is in many ways, but it is now also where the Pope lives. Right. Right? Room 201, by the way. <laughs> but uh, uh, another very special moment for me was his visit to the United States. Of course. And especially the uh, canonization of uh, St. Junipero Serra. Yeah because St. Junipero was the founder of California, and, uh, and I had the, the, the opportunity to talk to the Holy Father before the, uh, the, uh, his, his trip to the United States and, and talk about the, the, the uh, reality of this immigrant uh, who was an, a missionary and came to bring the faith to the United States. 
so it was very special to be there. And then they invited me to be uh, on the on the sanctuary to co celebrate with the with the Holy Father. So it was very special. And that was that was a Catholic year, right? Catholic year. The, what they called the bass on the grass. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know what I remember from that trip? I mean, you know, there were so many magic moments. Yeah. You know, I mean, his speech to Congress, you remember. Oh, amazing. Um, where he rolled out his fantastic four Americans. Remember Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther yeah. King, Dorothy Day, and Thomas Merton. Yeah. Uh, his, his address to the UN, you know, uh, and all of that. But I honest to God think, uh, and I actually confirmed this later when I had the opportunity to ask him, what was your favorite moment? You know, just personally, I mean, not in terms of big yeah. political significance, but just personally, you know, what was your favorite moment? And he told me it was that visit to Our Lady Queen of Angels in East Harlem. Oh, You know, the, the school yeah. of disadvantaged kids, right? right? Uh, you know, largely minority, a lot of immigrants. Yeah. Uh, every, every kid there is on scholarship assistance and they're sure. free lunch eligible and all of that. And you could tell from his body language, he just lit up, yeah. you know? I mean, he just absolutely loved that moment. You know, I think what that captured is, I, you know, I think every pope has like an alternative life that they might have led had they not become pope. Yeah. You know, I'm convinced that for John Paul it was being a movie star. You know, I think he would have been the Polish George Clooney, okay? You know, with Benedict, he obviously it was university professor, right? right? That was his alternative. Mm -hmm. Francis' alternative life is just being a simple parish priest someplace. Right. You know, because that, those pastoral moments uh, are where he just, I'm sure you've noted it too, yeah. right? When he has mm -hmm. to do this big formal, he'll do it because he knows it's important. Yeah. But in terms of what really engages him, uh, it's those moments of direct contact with ordinary people, particularly the vulnerable, the poor, the forgotten. Yeah. It's amazing. Where he just comes alive. Yeah. Right? Um, and you can tell it's sincere. You know, it's, it's, it's not some message cooked up in a Vatican PR war room, <laughs> right? But it's the real guy. Yeah, that's correct, yes. Right? Uh, are you going to have mass in L.A. to celebrate the anniversary? Uh, we don't have anything planned right now. <laughs> but, uh, well, you got three weeks. Good. Pull it together. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> listen, Archbishop Gomez, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for who you are. And listen, just on a personal basis, uh, I, wanna, I want you to hear me how grateful we are for the support that the Archdiocese of Los Angeles has shown to Crux. Um, yes. You know, we have this kind of working relationship uh, right. in which we supply some content to Angelus, which of course is your flagship print publication. Right. Uh, and in turn, you have had the great generosity to allow us to tap the expertise of your social media people. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, you have, I know you know this, so you don't need me to say it to you, but I will anyway. You have an absolutely phenomenal team. I mean, those people are just world's yeah. best uh, yeah. in terms of the Catholic take on the social media landscape and, and how to present an effective message uh, in that world. Uh, and the fact that you have been kind enough to allow us to tap into that is just unbelievably uh, helpful to us. No, I'm very happy that we are doing it, so it's a, it's a great blessing for us too. Well, thank you. I mean, you've got to be careful when you say stuff like that because you may end up on some promo package <laughs> that we do. Archbishop Jose All Gomez, right. you are a great churchman. You're a great thank human you. being. You're a great archbishop. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, John. That is A Drink with John. Again, apologies for the fact that the drink this time was merely <laughs> metaphorical, uh, but uh, I promise you, I have known Arch Gomez, Archbishop Gomez a very long time. I will find an occasion to deliver an actual right. drink to you <laughs> uh, at some point in the not-too-distant future. Thank you for being with us. Remember that Crux is your one-stop shopping destination for the best in Catholic news, analysis, and commentary. You can find us online at cruxnow.com. Join us next time for a drink with Jeff.